people are joining we'll give them a few minutes sure can you see the poster yes i can okay So hello everybody and uh, welcome to our first event in Back to School 2020 series which is focusing on going back to school during a pandemic. Can you see and hear me? Purima, can you see and hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you all for joining this Sunday afternoon and um, many more people will join us. And we are also live on Facebook on Asha USA Facebook page. Uh, so if you have friends who would like to join us, uh, feel free to share it with them. Uh, just logistically, I have turned off the audio and video for the participants. That way when our speaker starts talking, uh, we don't have any problem with the streaming. For those who don't know me, I'm Saili Amrapurkar. I'm the executive director with ASHA USA. ASHA USA is a nonprofit organization which focuses on creating health and harmony in the South Asian community. And uh, we do research, education, and programming. And one of our initiatives is Mental Health Matters. And in recent years, a lot of people asked us a, a lot of questions about physical health and mental health associated with COVID-19 and especially now that uh, kids are going back to school and college, uh, people have a lot of concerns. So we thought this will be a timely uh, event and we are having three speaker uh, events in this series during the month of September. Our first event is today. Next event is on Saturday, September 6th, uh, where we will have the world-renowned psych psychiatrist Dr. Anand Narkarni who will join us from India and uh, he will share his expertise and answer our questions about mental health and managing stress during this pandemic as we go back to school. On September 19th, sorry, September 19th, we will have our third event where uh, Sonali Bhatt, who is an experienced school counselor and head of the counseling department, at the prestigious Indian High Group of Schools in Dubai will join us on Zoom and she will give us helpful strategies related to um, adapting in school again during this time. So remember to tune into those two events in the future and you can stay up to date with all this information on our website which is ashausa.org or our Facebook page, like our Facebook page, Asha USA. So without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Purnima Kauthekar. Purnima, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come talk to us. We are very fortunate to have you here. So a little bit about Purnima. So Dr. Kauthekar is a very accomplished pediatrician and uh, she's a general pediatrician currently practicing at Health Partners and Regents Hospital in St. Paul. She received her medical degree from Boston University, her master's in public health from University of Minnesota, and she did her pediatric internship and residency at University of Minnesota. She provides care to children ranging from newborn 
to young adulthood. So all age groups from zero to 18 and um, uh, all the things to do with kids. And she particularly enjoys the long, long lasting relationships developed with her patients and their families in this primary care setting. And I would also like to note that she was born and raised in Twin Cities area and is now bringing up her own children in this community. And so she feels that this topic is thus very relevant and touching to her personally as well as professionally. So Purnima, again, welcome and thank you so much for taking time for us. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Saili. Good afternoon, namaste to all of you. As you said, this is clearly a very uh, personal and professional topic for me. I'm delighted to be here with all of you, excited to share with you and excited to learn from you. Um, we all clearly share this common goal of keeping ourselves and our children safe and healthy during this pandemic. So I'm excited to get started this afternoon, thank you. I can't see the slides. Can you all see my slides? Uh, no, I'm going to start the sharing now. Okay, sounds great. Thank Just you. Just give me a second. There, can you see the slides? I can see, but not the full launch. There we go. There we go. All right, I'm assuming everyone can see the slides also. So next slide, please. I wanna remind you that none of us have been through a pandemic in this generation before. So clearly we are all learning together, we are sharing together, we are growing together. Um, just remember that you were great parents before the pandemic, you are still great parents during the pandemic and will continue to be after the pandemic but we are working hard to navigate ourselves through this really challenging time. So make sure you are applauding yourselves because you're all doing a great job. We're all in this together. Next slide. I'm sorry, yeah. That's okay, that's okay. That's perfect, perfect. Um, one thing that I learned very on, very early on in my pediatric training, um, one of my supervisors, attending physician, said to me, children are not just little adults. And just stop and think about that for a minute. Because yes, they are still little people, but they are not little adults. Cognitively, physically, emotionally, they have very different needs than we do. On the other hand, children are very sensitive. They sense our emotions. They sense when we're sad, they sense when we're stressed, they sense when we're frustrated. Whether they are toddlers or they are teenagers, they are seeing and feeling what we are feeling. So while they sense our stress, our frustration and our fear, they also sense when we are patient, which is not always easy to do as parents. <laughs> they sense when we are calm and particular particularly during this time. They sense when we are showing them examples of resilience. And in turn, they often model our reactions to these emotions. And I added a little statement in there. That is a little pressure on us as parents, but they are modeling our reactions because this is new for us. It is new for our children also. So just remember that they are not little adults, but they are learning from us. Next slide, please. I will remind you at a time when we feel as if the world is just out of our control, we really can focus on what is within our control. We will take a look at the basics of staying healthy because we have all been doing that for years. We have been teaching our children since they were born, the basics of staying healthy. So I'd like to review a little bit of that that I know all of you do such a great job on already. And then of course the emphasis lately has been on hand washing, face masking, and physical distancing. So I'll focus on that also. But remind yourselves to focus on what really is within your control because there really is a lot within our control. Next slide, please. There should be one before, perfect. 
Think of the basics of taking care of ourselves, getting enough sleep. I wish I could see a show of hands. How many of you are getting eight to 10 hours of sleep? I'll keep my hand down. <laughs> but we really should. We should be getting that eight to 10 hours of sleep. Our screens, our children's screens, they should be off two hours before bedtime. And we should be avoiding caffeine before we go to sleep to ensure that we are receiving what's called restorative sleep. That's, that should be our goal. From a nutrition standpoint, we all know that what we put into our bodies is so important to our physical and emotional health. But keep it simple, three healthy meals a day, one to two snacks because we get hungry in between meals. Our snacks should be fruits, vegetables, and water. Think about your three, four, and five servings of fruits or vegetables each day. Drink at least three eight ounces eight ounce glasses of water a day. I know you guys all know these things, but thinking back to the basics, these are important for preventing any form of illness. And lastly, keeping ourselves physically active. The American Heart Association still says 60 minutes of mild to moderate physical activity five times a week. That should be our goal. We can do it. We don't need to carve out an hour each day, but we could take multiple small increments and still achieve that goal. 15 minutes, four times a day, 10 minutes, six times a day, 20 minutes, three times a day, we can all do it. And remember, exercising together is really fun. If it's not with your children, maybe with your partner, maybe with somebody else within your social circle, which we'll talk about. Next slide, please. Is that the right slide? I'm still seeing the same one. Oh, there we go. And thinking more about illness prevention, make sure you and your children are up to date on your annual physicals. With the pandemic, some of us have truly lost track of time. Check in with your doctor and say, did they have their physical at their last birthday? Oh, they missed it. Go ahead and head into your doctor. That is so important for disease prevention. And if you're feeling uncomfortable about going into your clinic, I can speak for mine. We have all worked so hard to ensure that our clinics are safe for our well patients. There's screening at the front door. There's physical distancing in the waiting rooms. Remind yourselves that you were keeping up with those checkups before the pandemic so we can still do it safely during the pandemic. Very, very important. Make sure you and your children have their vaccines up to date. Those shots are so important. There are data to suggest that potentially boosting our immunity with other vaccines can also help us fight off COVID. So we wanna make sure that those vaccines are up to date. And a highlight, we are entering flu season. So make sure you're talking to your doctor's office about flu shots being available. I know they're available commercially already at Target, Walgreens, Walmart, the local pharmacies but most of our clinics will have flu shots available within the first or second week of September. So make sure you're putting that on your schedules. Another way that we've always prevented illness and injury, knowing our social circles, who is sick around us and avoiding contact with those people at, at this particular time. And of course the show, social responsibility, stay home if you are unwell or your family members are unwell to protect our larger community. Again, all of these things, you have all been doing these for years, just reminding yourselves of what we do have control over. And we do have control over all of these things. Next slide, please. Hand washing, it seems so basic. And of course it's all over the media right now, but it's so important that I thought I have to highlight it. Of course, soap and water is best before, during and after preparing food. Before we eat, remember when we eat, that's when we touch our face, we touch our nose, reminding yourselves of the importance of hand washing before you eat, especially for us parents. How many of us wipe our child's nose with a tissue? We don't even think about it. Make sure you're washing your hands after you're doing that. Before and after putting the Band-Aid on the cut, you wanna be, be sure to wash your hands. Of course, after using the bathroom, blowing your nose, coughing, sneezing, 
when you're taking care of your pets at home, make sure you're washing your hands as you feed your pets, as your pets lick you or snuggle with you. Make sure you're washing your hands, of course, after touching the garbage. And I also wanna highlight, we've been talking a lot about using hand sanitizer. If your hands are visibly greasy or dirty, make sure you are using soap and water to get the dirt and the grease off of them. Next slide, please. Remind our children also, and I feel like we sometimes forget, I know my own, they run into the bathroom, they put some soap on their hands and then they run out. I say, but we didn't scrub. Remind your children of the 20 seconds of scrub. Lather your hands with the soap, scrub together for 20 seconds, the palms of your hands, the backs of your hands, in between the fingers, and we always forget the nails. Have them sing happy birthday two times, twinkle, twinkle, little star. They're ABCs two times. That's 20 seconds. It's not that long, but they forget and we forget. So just remind, remind ourselves, if we're going to bother to wash our hands, let's do it effectively. And then I mentioned a little bit about hand sanitizer because we often wonder how effective is it? Truly soap and water is best, but if that's all that's available, go ahead and use your hand sanitizer during the times that I mentioned above. Um, and then as soon as you have access to soap and water, make sure you're rewashing again. Next slide, please. Mask wearing. We're doing it. We're seeing others do it. It feels like it should be so simple. Just put your mask on, right? It's actually really difficult. It is hard to remember. It is hard to keep the mask on. It is hard to feel like we're seeing people's expressions underneath the mask. Acknowledge this for your children. Tell them, yeah, it's hard for me too. Remind them that it is really important. I highlight as a child, I remember learning how to wear my seatbelt. That was hard. We used to pile 10 kids in the car. It was so fun. We'd be packed on top of each other. We didn't worry about seatbelts, right? But our mask is becoming like our seatbelt. We would not put our children in the car now without their car seat or without their seatbelt, we would not drive the car. Think of your mask as the same way. Think of putting your mask on before you go outside, but remind yourselves it is not easy. Emphasize to your children, it is not optional when we go outside. And next slide, please. I'll keep going, but remember- Yeah, yeah. Remember you know, I wanted to just say that I think yeah. Punima, this is very important because one thing that uh, parents ask always is how can we make sure that kids put their mask on it can be a kindergartner or a seventh grader yes. you know what it means so i think this is a very good analogy of a seat belt because seat belt is something that nobody will say no we don't want to they know it is mandatory so similarly we should consider masks mandatory right now so yeah i love it that. i love that because kids also know the seat belt is not an option Exactly. So, so, but it's important to teach them. And on this slide, I highlight that they need to practice. They're not used to it. We acknowledge that Th this is something brand new for them. And it's hard. You feel hot behind your mask. You feel sweaty. There's a lot of, I know in my office too, I, I have to have a child keep repeating themselves because I can't he hear them very well. They have to speak louder underneath that max mask, excuse me. And it's tiring. It's tiring mm -hmm. for children. It's tiring for adults. So take the time to help them learn how to wear it and practice. Try different styles of masks if you have access. I'm kind of amazed at all the different styles out there. There's pleated masks. There's a duck bill mask, there's ear loops, there's bandanas. Try different types of fabrics. Some are a little more breathable, especially for those of you who will be sending your child to school for seven, eight hours a day. Think about um, finding a mask for them that is most comfortable. Not wearing it is not an option, but we can certainly teach them how to wear it and for longer durations of time. As I say here, start with short periods of time even just a few minutes, start with a few minutes, have them take off, re take it off, remind your children to breathe under the mask. We have had many experiences in the office of children passing out because they forget to breathe under the mask. If they are talking to you, if they are singing to you, they are breathing. 
So remind them to talk under their mask, sing a song with them, go for a walk around the block and practice wearing the mask. They will get used to it. I know they will get used to it, but it will take time. I um, some, some parents tell me that I bribe the kids because I, I talk about positive reinforcement in pediatrics. How do we get our children to potty train? For example, we give them small sticker rewards or tattoo rewards for, for sitting on the potty. Very similarly, for wearing their mask around the block, highlight that you're so proud of them. They did such a good job and gradually increase that duration of time with those incentives. Children don't have that same sense of incentive that we do to prevent illness transmission, but they have the incentive of a sticker or a tattoo and they will love it. They will love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, oh, one related question was, yeah. is it healthy for kids to wear a mask, say if they are, they're going to be at school so for five hours or six hours, is it healthy for them to breathe through their mask for that uh, whole time? It is a great question and the way you phrased it is key. They have to breathe through their mask. That's what's very important. I have looked at a lot of data on this. We worried initially with the masks about retaining carbon dioxide. Would we not breathe out enough? Would we hold it in too long? Which we know that can be dangerous for our health. But the way the masks are designed, they are breathable. We just have to remember to breathe. So again, this is about practice, reminding your children, even when they're talking, they're breathing. So that's really important. I am hearing from more and more schools that they are planning, even for the secondary schools, middle and high schools, they are planning to have more outdoor time because they want to allow children time to be mask free. My understanding is that class times may be longer, individual class times may be longer, depending on whether your schools are starting back hybrid or some, some other form of back to school. But they, schools will be encouraging children to step outside and take their mask off and be physically distant from one another in order to avoid the concern that we are not breathing under those masks. But it is, it is safe for them, but it's about mm -hmm. the practice. Great yeah. Question. And what I hear you saying is, especially for younger kids, it is sort of like, for example, we live in Minnesota, right? In Minnesota, when the weather changes from, say, warmer weather to cooler weather, we have to train our kids once again to get into those jackets and winter <laughs> coats and hands right, right. and hats. And yeah. every fall, it's sort of a little training and transition period. Similarly, I think this year, we have to also help them train themselves to wear a mask mask and maintain the six feet distance. I think it's a part of the whole process. It is. Yes, absolutely. That's another great analogy, especially in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Another question that I've been getting a lot and kind of, like I said, going back to the basics of um, prevention of disease transmission. I like to say physical distance because I think we can still socialize but we do need to try our best to maintain that six feet of distance in order to prevent the droplets that can be transmitted if we're closer together. For children, the CDC still guides us, limit in-person playtime with other children. Notice it says limit, it does not say exclude. We wanna connect with our peers virtually if possible, for our friends and relatives who are out of town, encourage your children to write cards and send letters. That seems like the easy thing that they can do to connect with out of town relatives. One thing I wanna highlight, and I'll say this a couple of different ways when we're talking about COVID-19 transmission, the more people in our social circle and the longer we spend with them, the higher the risk of transmission of this illness. So once again, the more people we are together with and the longer we spend with them, the higher the risk is that we are transmitting this illness. So if you think about the opposite, if you can limit the number of people in your social circle and you can limit the duration of time that you spend with them, you can prevent spread of this disease if we also abide by the precautions of mask wearing, physical distancing of the six feet apart, and then at the end of our play date, washing our hands or even taking a shower to make sure that we're doing a good job of cleaning ourselves afterwards. I do highlight 
lowest, medium, highest risk of transmission. Again, lowest would be no in-person play dates. And I know many of our children are struggling with that. But if we go to our next slide too, I'll show you how we can fit play dates into this medium risk category. One thing that many families have chosen to do is form a small, less than 10 person pandemic pod to help balance our social needs with our safety goals. Think about the number of people in that group if you're choosing to do this and how you meet the social needs of each of your family members in that group. It's tricky because you can be friends with different social circles, say, oh, I like the mom in this group, my husband likes the dad in this group and my children like the dad in this group, but that's not maintaining that less than 10 person pod. So if you are choosing to form this small pandemic pod where you know that they are also abiding by your safety goals for your family, then make sure that the people in your pod are also meeting the social needs of your family. Again, safe socializing is still six feet apart, being outdoors, wearing your mask, that's all best. One thing is very hard for us culturally is to avoid eating and drinking when we get together. It, it, is, it is just within our beautiful culture to wanna to share food and share drink and bring something over. But in this case, if you can set up a 30 to 60 minute social hour where you can avoid the food or drink, that is best. Remember, if you're eating or drinking, you're taking your mask off. And then we have increased our risk pool to that higher risk category from the medium risk category. Bring your outdoor games and toys, bring music, listen to music, dance together, be active together. That, that should be our goal to be social, not to eat and drink together. When we get through this pandemic, we will have a lot of time to eat and drink together. Next slide, please. Yeah, those are really good tips, uh, Purnima. Thank you. Yeah, so again, when we are choosing to socialize outdoors, I want to add some ca caveats to that. Know your risk pool. Is anyone in your immediate family at high risk? You need to know that for yourselves. And if you don't, it's okay, but check with your doctor before setting up these social outings. Have these important conversations on the phone before you get together with people. Know if anyone in the social circle that you are gathering with is at high risk also. Among adults, the risk for severe illness from COVID-19 is our elderly population. So if we think of it, the older we are, including myself potentially, because I'm older than 43 other years of people, um, but the older we are, the greater the risk of complication of the disease. We all know that we're hearing about our children can acquire COVID and they can actually be very healthy. We should be most concerned about our elderly, in our, case, in our cases, our parents and our grandparents. This population is at highest risk. I do highlight in my slide there some very high risk individuals based on the, the disease that they carry with them. So again, knowing your risk pool before you set up these social outings is very important. Yeah, so uh, Purima, I, because I hear this parent's concern that, you know, my child had an underlying um, uh, health issue growing up and now though she has outgrown it, but still she's susceptible, but you know, she see all her friends socializing, but how do I tell her or how do I tell others that she can't go play with them. So it looks like you're saying it's a good idea to talk about this with your child and why she cannot go or let the friend's mom know that this is the reason we cannot socialize with you right now. Right? Correct. Absolutely. I think that depending on the age range, they may or may not understand really their risk pool. For example, our children with asthma, even when it's flu season, we talk to them about taking extra care to protect themselves to avoid asthma exacerbations. That seems like, especially in Minnesota, it's a very common illness that we see, but we want our children with asthma to be extra safe. And, and remember that you're the parents, so you get to choose, Is along with your doctor, of course, you get to choose, am I comfortable with some level of medium risk or do I wanna hold my child into that 
um, lowest risk category and really have no socialization because that's okay. But then you need to explain to your child because of course they're going to feel like they look out the window and other kids are socializing in the street or other kids are going back to school. But it, I think the best way to phrase it to your child is we're all keeping healthy and safe and we need to do this to keep you healthy and safe. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving on because we're all ready to break free. We're ready to get back to school, right? And we really need to. Remember that none of us loved school or work every day. We had those days that were hard and we had those days that were easier or better. We had them even before the pandemic and we will continue to do so. So don't be disheartened if you say to yourself, gosh, that was a really tough day. The days will get better. They will get easier. Some will be hard, some will be easy. Remember, you're leading by example. Remember those little people who are watching you even if you're having a bad day, you have to pretend. You have to pretend. Let your positive attitude shine through each morning as we start our day off. When those tough moments come, you're still allowed to be real. That was a tough moment of our day, but it's going to get better. Lead by that positive example. And I'll talk more about setting a daily schedule and sticking to it because for all of us emotionally, that daily schedule gives us something to look forward to when we're having that tough moment of the day. It's going to get better because at the end of the day, we have this coming. Mm -hmm. Getting ready for the first day of school, guys, it's real. It's coming right up. And you know what? It actually looks more similar to years past than we even think. Think about going on a scavenger hunt at home. We've got to dust off our backpacks, dust off our alarm clock, Find that lunchbox that we had put away in, in during the last school year and get those things ready because kids get excited about that stuff. They get excited about school supplies. Even if you say, oh, they're just going to, this, to school in the basement, they're doing distance learning. They still can get excited about getting their school supplies together. You don't have to go back to school shopping, but you can. If that's something that your kids are used to and you think that that's something that's going to give them some momentum for the new school year, doesn't have to be going back to Target. Let's go dig it up in the basement or the closet or still in your backpack from last school year. Let's go take a look at all that stuff and make it exciting for them to get ready for that first day of school. Take those first day of school pictures like you would have last year even if they're going to be sitting at the kitchen table. That's okay. Make it exciting for them. Make that first day just exciting, as exciting as any other first day. One thing that I will highlight in a couple different ways is write that schedule on a whiteboard for our younger children who are learning. If they can't read quite yet, have a color-coded system for them to understand when is the end of math, when is the end of reading. If they can read, Make sure you're writing it up so they have timings. They're going to look at the clock and say, oh, it's only 9.45. I've only been in school for 25 minutes. By 9.50, we're going to be done with that subject. So they have to look forward to that. For your older kids, have an electronic calendar, a Google calendar, so they know that you're watching what subject that they're on and they know what, what you're expecting from them after that subject. I'm not very savvy with electronics, but I'm learning. It really helps the kids know what to look forward to and what they can put behind themselves from earlier in the day. Next slide, please. Remember that each stage of development for our children will be different and each of them will have different physical and emotional needs. You know your child better than anybody else. Whether they are toddlers or adolescents, you know what their needs were last year and you will thus know what their needs are this year. Try to hone in on those needs that they had during the school year last year and know what those needs might be this year. They will change, but try to focus on the needs that you already know, whether it's organization, packing their backpack, or maybe it's the social need. Try to focus in on, on that for them and see how you can achieve their goals and yours. Some common things themes, excuse me, that all of our children need, they need reassurance. Just like some days we don't know, we're saying to ourselves, when is this going to end? They all need reassurance. We are going to get through this. We're going to get through it together. They need some encouragement. You are doing a great job. They need to know that because it's hard. They need to know that you're seeing them doing a great job. 
Children also need limits and boundaries. You cannot watch YouTube videos when you should be doing your schoolwork. They need to know that and they need to know that you're watching them. All children need consequences, but depending on their phase of development, those consequences will vary. They all need to re be reminded that this is hard for us and they all need to be reminded that they are loved. So when we talk about toddlers and preschools, of course, this is a very different phase of development. They need more direct care than our older kids. Typically, their attention span is shorter. They need a variety of activities planned out throughout their day. So for those of you who are working from home, you can also get your work done. Try to plan those activities before your day starts. One example I have is be the station master. Set up stations so that your toddler can rotate through these stations throughout the day. They may or may not need your encouragement to get through those stations, but at least they will have many options throughout the day. Designate areas for blocks, designate areas for dolls, for their kitchen set, for their artwork. So these stations can be pre-assembled for them and given their short attention span, they can go between the stations and you don't necessarily have to be a part of it. If there are times in your day when you can take a break for 15 minutes and you can sit by them, you can still keep doing your work. Toddlers love parallel play. They wanna know that somebody is there next to them, but they don't necessarily need you playing with them. They need encouragement. Oh, I love what you're making. Can you make another one for me? Can you make another one for your sister or your brother or for your neighbor, something like that. They just need little pieces of encouragement and then they can get back to back to their other station. So that's an idea for keeping toddlers busy while you're trying to get your work done. Next slide, please. Thinking about our school age children, so mainly our elementary and maybe early middle school ages. Again, create a daily schedule and make it visible. Have your child at this age work with you to create this schedule. They remember when the bell went off. They remember when they had a bathroom break, when they would go to lunch and recess. Help them, help, help, allow them to help you, excuse me, make that schedule. This is really important. Routines can help reduce anxiety and thus improve behavior. They were so used to routine last year. We are somewhat creating a new routine for them, but we can model it a little bit after what they're used to from last year. So use your children as a guide to help you make that schedule. Remember that this schedule has to be a little bit flexible because even their teachers are gonna send different materials throughout the day. So there has to be some flexibility built into this schedule. But guess what guys, rise and shine time has to be the same every day. They may need that alarm clock again and they may need that extra nudge to get them out of bed. Breakfast, lunch time, snack times, those should be pretty solid in your schedules. They should be able to plan ahead and they should be able to either help you or you help them preset your meals, pack your lunch the night before, just like you would be going to school. Set up your work, your work times, meaning their, their work times with 10 minute breaks. Again, some of this will vary depending on school schedules and the duration of their class periods, but try to set up those breaks in the middle What's different at home if they are working from home is that they're sitting for a longer period of time. So they need stretch breaks. They need snack breaks. They need to get physical, doing jumping jacks, doing stretches. I added in some quiet times. Some of our adolescents will wanna take that power nap. It's okay, as long as it's within that 10 to 15 minute break time. So setting up those break times will help reduce anxiety, reduce stress, and help everybody get through their, their days a little bit easier. Um, I think that is a very important uh, piece of information, Purnima, because uh, we have heard from elementary school kids, parents, as well as middle school or even high school parents that it has been very hard for the kids to wake up in the morning at a certain time because they don't have that schedule to look forward to. Like right. if they were in school or going to a summer camp, they would be excited to get up like 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. and get ready. But now since there's nothing scheduled um, 
as such they or everything is online they don't have that motivation to get up and get ready or eat breakfast so all the day looks like very like a vacation day on a regular right. basis so they are concerned that once the school starts how are they going to manage so i think this is a very good uh, guideline as to what the parents can do to get the kids ready uh, to start the school exactly exactly we all want something to look forward to so and i'll talk about this later too but maybe it's talking about it the weekend before or maybe your child needs that reminder every evening that this is what our next day is going to look like and i did highlight for this age range make sure there's something to look forward to on their daily schedule at the end of their day mm -hmm. plan a bike ride in there plan a family walk if it's beautiful outside and your child loves to run through the sprinkler put that on their schedule so they know that's what's going to happen at the end of this great school day today because they need something to look forward to just like all of us so make sure you highlight that on your schedule too remember that as we are teaching our children to stick to this schedule and get to this get through this new routine they need an incentive. I talked about this a little bit with the mask wearing also. They don't have that same intrinsic sense that we do that we have to do this because we are we have to get through school. They may need more of the rewards. And in the office, I talk a lot about jelly beans in a jar. If they get a certain number of jelly beans or pennies in a jar, they get a certain number of pennies in the jar for their really positive behavior then they have something really special to look forward to on the weekend. Remember, changing habits is very difficult even for adults. So for our children especially, they need to know that there's a reward in place for them. And setting those rewards up is really important at this age especially. Mm -hmm. We talked about looking forward to something weekly or daily. Again, knowing what your child's needs are. Early on, it may be a daily reward that they need it as they get into a new routine. It may be weekly or it may even be monthly. That's my hope for all of you. <laughs> yeah. Give choices at this age. Like I was saying before, even setting that daily routine, giving them choices will help them feel a little bit empowered with their next day or their next week. And that's very powerful for a child to feel like their voice is heard and that it matters to you what they're looking forward to, for example. We still need to provide that structure for them, but where we can give them choices, allow them some independence to make those choices. And, I just and especially I think uh, middle school and high school kids, they should be equal partners in making that schedule that they want to do for the day or the week. Because if they have uh, ownership, if they own what they're planning, then they might be more invested and ready to do it rather than a parent telling them what to do. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think sticking to that structure will be thus uh, more incentivized if they have more of a say in it. And then we move right in. Adolescents need that structure also, just like you said, Sylee, work with them to create that daily schedule. And again, both of us were highlighting work together with them. I want them, unlike our school age kids, we talked about that reward and reinforcement. Our adolescents have been doing this structured learning for a lot longer. We should expect them to be able to stick to the schedule that they created with you and hold them accountable for it they have to know what is the negative consequence if I am not sticking to this schedule, just like there would be a negative consequence at school. They should be well aware of what will happen if I'm not sticking to this schedule. But again, working with them to create the schedule will make it much easier for them to want to stick to it. Um, I add this particularly for adolescents about free screen time to their schedules because many of them are entirely on their screens for school now. It's, it goes against everything I've ever learned in pediatrics, less than two hours of screen time. This, this time is so unusual. So you still need to give them their free screen time. It's not fair to say you've been on the screen all day long, so you can't be on the screen this evening to G-chat with your friends or watch a video or play your video games they need to look forward to that time too, as long as again, and this goes back to holding them accountable for sticking to the schedule, as long as they were able to get their work done during the day, do what's within the comfort level for each of your families for allowing them some free screen time. 
and then um, don't you think that if you have multiple kids depending on their age this is going to look different for different kids absolutely so it's not going to be that all kids in our family are going to follow the schedule it's going to be very different depending on the age and what each child likes to do and things like that absolutely and and i love how you phrased it too sally because just because even if they're in the same middle school range high school range uh, middle school and elementary school have give them again something to look forward to that they love because each of our children love different things just because one wants free screen time doesn't mean that the other one really wants that but mm. there may be some conflicts because your younger children may want the same privileges as your older children but yeah. remember this isn't going to be the first time that we're highlighting differences between our children so have those conversations like you would have before this is what's going to be allowed for your age range and this is what's going to be allowed for your age range if they know that ahead of time that will help not completely eliminate the conflict but it will help a little bit exactly and it also means that the job of the parents is even way more complex now uh, managing that and balancing that but absolutely. yeah this is something that we really need to keep in mind <laughs> yes absolutely um, one thing that I'll highlight with our teenagers is sometimes we think like, okay, let them go for eight hours. They have eight hours of school. They actually really need us to check in on them. And if you feel like you have a good trusting relationship with your adolescent, tell them, I'm going to check in with you at 1050 when you have your break. Put that into their schedule so they know you're just checking in on maybe basic needs, food and water. Maybe it's, I know yesterday you had a hard time with this math. Did you check in with your teacher? Making sure that they're aware that you are checking in with their work and checking in on their overall well being. If there have been reasons to not trust in the past, also let them know that I'm going to be making some unannounced check ins. So I know you're not on YouTube, I know you're not on GChat. I need to make sure that you are sticking to your schoolwork during school times. So again, addressing the specific needs of your child. Predetermined breaks are absolutely necessary. They cannot and should not be sitting in front of their screens for eight hours a day. They should not. Just like they have predetermined breaks in, in school, they're walking in the hallways, they have lunch breaks, they still need to have those when they are distance learning or potentially hybrid learning. They need to socialize. We've talked a lot about safe ways to do this, but think about incorporating that into their daily or weekly schedules. Also, they, they are social at this age. They need that, we know that. And again, reminding our teens and tweens about going back to the basics. That sleep piece with adolescents is so, so hard. They really need to reset those sleep cycles. I remember having to do this after the summer's off so going back to school in September at this point, actually just a week away, is not really going to be that much different because they're still going to be expected to be checking in if they're distance learning and they need to reset those sleep, sleep schedules, reminding them of what I call sleep hygiene. Their screen should be off two hours before bedtime. They should be setting their alarms each morning. I don't know how many of yours are doing it, but they should be getting eight to 10 hours of sleep at night. That should be our goal for them. Yeah, yeah. We have already talked to our kids that <laughs> starting this weekend, we are trying to go back to sleep on time half an hour early every night so that by the time school starts, we are there. We can that's be perfect. ready for school that's at 8 a.m. <laughs> Again, not easy, but that should be our goal. Yeah, but I like this idea that you need to check in with your teen because generally after a certain age, parents say, oh, you know, I don't have to check on him. He follows his own schedule and they will let them sleep in. They'll eat, let them eat whenever they want. They'll let them, you know, decide their own things. But I think right now we all need that um that goal-oriented schedule, even as adults, where we have to work from home, we have to make ourselves follow a schedule so that we can attend meetings, we can have lunch and things like that. And we also like exactly. to go for a walk or something. So though our teen might not be asking us, but I think it is a good idea to look at them and make sure they're getting all of that. They're getting proper nutrition, sleep, 
physical activity and maybe socializing either on phone or video or just taking long distance walks or something like that. But yeah, yeah I think it's very important. I agree. Yeah. They need to know we're there. Yep. So as we return to school, I think there's so much variability in the Twin Cities. Are we returning full time? Are we distance learning? Are we doing some hybrid? And I know for many of us as parents, just in the last week, the plans have changed. So things are changing constantly. And, and to be honest, they may change again based on our transmission rates. But what can we do? The first thing I'll remind you, which I know we feel, feel overwhelmed with information, keep ourselves informed on community transmission rates. Yeah, keep yourselves informed. It's hard to know exactly where do you look for that. Governor Walsh, and I highlight that in my next slide, um, has highlighted for us at what range of case numbers we should be thinking that our schools are safe to return to and at what range of case numbers we should be thinking we should be 100% distance learning with a lot of variability in the middle, which can be very confusing, yes. I only put this up not to review the whole thing, but to remind you that you can look, at, look for this on the Minnesota Department of Education website, or even Governor Walz's website has this also pretty readily available. And then you're looking to your county of residence to show you where do we fall for transmission rates. On the other hand, as all of you parents know, our school districts are making their own decisions also. So when I when we go back to the slide, I was saying, talk to your school administrators and know what they are doing specific to your school in terms of distance, hybrid, or um, complete reopening. So know your school. Are they reopening? If they're not, when are they re revisiting these conversations? We've been hearing a lot about emergency school board meetings. School administrators are trying their best to reopen. I think that that is their goal for everybody, but they want to do it in a really safe way, safe for your children and safe for their staff. So know what their criteria are for reopening and very specifically know what are their safety measures that they will have in place if and when our children return to school. That will help to ease our anxiety as parents for ourselves, for our children, as well as for the staff and administrators in our school. Again, just like we talked about remembering what is within our control as we socialize, remember what is within our control for our children. This all goes back to teaching them about physical distancing. If they are with you and you are modeling that six feet of distance as you go for a walk with your friends, they will model that behavior when they are in school also but make sure that your school is highlighting that to you. Student to student distances, student to staff distances, staff to staff distances um, should be six feet apart. There was recent conversation with the Minnesota Department of Health of whether or not three feet apart with face coverings is safe enough. I think the Minnesota Department of Education has gone away from that and they are really looking for our schools to reopen when we can safely be six feet apart with our masks on. So look to your schools to be highlighting that for you. See what they're doing with their outdoor spaces, not just for gym class. We may be having some outdoor classrooms. You know, these are many schools are creating pod environments where children may have to walk outdoors to some type, type of tent environment or temporary pod so that we can keep them in smaller classrooms. This is really important for you to know again, to feel secure when you send your kids back to school. Mask wearing is safe for all children over two years of age. It is hard between two to five years of age. If you have preschoolers or kids who are in daycare right now, you may find yourselves going to pick them up and none of the kids have masks on. I would say above five years of age when they are entering kindergarten, we should be making mask wearing mandatory for kids who are in school. And again, working with your doctors, if there are special needs for your child, working with their occupational therapist or working with their therapist to help them overcome the mask. Many in my office, I am talking to them by video initially, teaching them how to wear a mask, showing them what I wear at work, a face mask, a mask, a gown, gloves, to keep them safe 
And then it's really great to see they're feeling comfortable and they're wearing their mask for short durations of time. And we do check-ins weekly with some of my kids to applaud them and highlight to them what a great job they're doing of wearing their mask so they can do it. But again, it goes back to that practicing. Hand washing, seeing what your schools have in place in terms of sanitizer. I know a lot of schools are even adding sinks in the hallways so that kids can be washing their hands with soap and water more readily. Send that hand sanitizer though in the lunchbox and, and practice having them use it. I think I highlighted some of these special scenarios, knowing your child again, special learning needs, physical needs, emotional needs, talking to your doctors and talking to your school administrators. As I really do feel we are preparing to go back to school at some point, school is going to look very different. So make sure that your school administrators and your teachers know about your child's special needs. We talked a lot about struggling with masks already. So here are my take home points, guys. Know your child, know their phase of development and know their unique and special needs. As we go back to the basics, think about how we prevented illness all these years. Take care of your physical health, take care of your emotional health needs, get enough sleep, eat well, drink your water, three glasses of water every day and be physically active. Wash our hands, soap and water is best, sanitizer is second best. Wear our masks, physically distance ourselves, but still do our best to be social in these safe ways. As we go back to school, age specific, think of setting your schedules, giving your children choices and empowering them with those choices and creating incentives to them for sticking to their daily goals and schedules. Lastly, I wanna remind you again that we're all doing this together. None of us have been through a pandemic before. We are learning, growing and sharing together. So I hope you remember that we're all doing this together. Thank you, everybody. I think it's going to be a great year and one like no other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Purnima. That was really wonderful. A great Thank reminder uh, about what to do as we prepare ourselves. And I want to ask uh, people if they have any questions, uh, please uh, type them in the chat box. And uh, in the meantime, I have some questions that parents had uh, submitted. Sure. I think you have answered most of the questions, but there's one question where uh, this couple says that uh, the husband and wife, they are both torn between whether to do hybrid or online for their kids. Okay. So they think that their younger one who is in first grade needs hybrid experience because you know, she needs to meet other kids at least twice a week so that she can interact and that social um, need gets uh, satisfied. But they have two older kids, a middle schooler and high schooler, and they think that they will be better off doing online. But they are in this, you know, challenging um, time where they're trying to make the decision. So one question they have is, what are some of the things you would like us to consider when we are making this decision for different kids of different ages? Uh, is hybrid better than online and so on and so forth? It's such a great question and a real scenario for many of us. Um, I think kindergarten through third grade, we are really establishing a foundation for our children and their educational future. And I think a lot of us are concerned about that. What are they gonna miss out on if they don't have that social interaction? I think about kindergarten and first grade, you learn how to raise your hand, stand in a line. You can't learn that online, can you? You can't. So thinking about your child's unique needs, what was kindergarten like for your first grader? What do we need to work on, or your, sorry, kindergartner, now first grader, what do we need to work on in first grade? If you think your child still needs to work on those basic needs as they build their foundation for school, the hybrid is a great option if, and I add a caveat, if you feel really comfortable with the school's precautions that are in place, making sure that they are they are ready for our children to be six feet apart, that they are ready for mask wearing, that they are ready for our kids to take their mask off. And what are they gonna do if that happens? Talk to your school administrators about all of those things 
so that if you choose the hybrid option because that is best for your child, I fully support that. But make sure that your school has those precautions in place that you need to feel comfortable with that decision. Hmm. On the other hand, if you feel that your first grader learned that basic foundation in kindergarten and you think they don't necessarily need the socialization that many of our younger elementary kids need, I fully support you keeping them home with 100% distance learning. Again, meeting your child's unique needs is what I would highlight there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good way to understand because each of us is struggling with that choice. Absolutely. And uh, I did not see any questions, so I think uh, we can wrap up. I would just like to quickly summarize a few important points that you told us today. One thing is that depending on the age of your child, um, you know your child the best and you know their unique needs and what uh, they will do well in. So you make the decision for each child depending on their unique needs. Uh, and most importantly, focus on all aspects, their physical needs, emotional needs, uh, psychological needs, and make sure that you create a schedule so that they feel the, uh, the framework within which a structure within which they can spend their day when they're doing school, whether it's at home or going to school as a hybrid. And I also like the fact that you say that parents need to model this behavior. So wearing a mask, washing hands, social distancing, uh, socializing from uh, you know six feet or more outside, and and reassuring the child and having a positive attitude. I think all those are very important things that we need to do as parents if we want our kids to do those things. So uh, thank you, Purnima. That was very very valuable, and uh, we have this on Facebook Live, which is going to be a video available for anybody to watch if they missed it or want to go back to it. So thank you once again for joining us, everybody. And thank you, Purnima. Thank you all. Thank you all. Good luck with the school year, everybody. Yes, all the best. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. And I will see you next Saturday for our next event, where we will go on talking about the mental health needs of our students and parents. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.